if you have any questions about today's session but don't have an opportunity to ask those questions during the session, please uh, send me an email or post a question to the lecture discussion um, in the forum. Today's, uh, this week's forum discussion has already been posted. Uh, it's regarding funding or financial planning for preservation. Uh, some pretty good discussions from last week in the forums, I noticed. Uh, interesting uh, diversion into the discussion on copyright and its issues in digitization or creating digital surrogates. That was another interesting little side topic that came up in the, in the uh, forum discussion this week. Um, so I look forward to seeing what uh, your discussions will, uh, where it will go this Okay, please pause your microphone. Mute your microphone. Okay, uh, I've just muted everybody. Uh, hopefully everyone can still hear me. But I've done a, a global mute. So if you're concerned that I can't hear you, um, I will do a Q&A uh, as we go through the session where I will unmute and ask you to unmute yourself. Um, now, if we, it's about 22 now. Um, I'm going to go through the, through the lecture slides. Uh, at the end of the lecture, I'll show you where you can locate the quiz for this week. So this week we're looking at collection care. Uh, we are going to do quiz three for non-paper materials preservation. Uh, the quiz is available through my courses. Uh, there we go. Uh, as individual, okay. Um, as you go through the session, uh, through the quiz, I'll ask you, of course, to try not to uh, try not to collaborate, answer your own quiz. You know, uh, I, I do trust that you folks are going to do uh, your own quizzes and try not to collaborate. Um, let's have a quick review of quiz number two for paper-based materials. I'm just going to open up the uh, open up the quiz key. The hyperlinks in the slides that are shown on WebEx don't work. Um, but when I post the slides to my courses, the, to the module for content, uh, it will work there. They will work there. I'm just bringing up the key for paper-based material quiz. Okay, so we're going back into here. And... Just one moment while I bring this up. Hmm. Okay, here we are. It's just taking a few minutes to import it. Import the file. There we are. Okay, so uh, the first answer I was looking for was specifically lignin. Uh, there was a hint there and where, where it kind of is self-referential to the answer right there. Uh, the response to number two, uh, we were looking for alkaline, making them alkaline towards the alkaline end of the pH scale. Uh, however, more stable uh, was one of the responses, but it wasn't uh, as specific as what we were looking for, what I was looking for. There we go. Sorry about that, folks. Uh, okay, let's see. Answer number three. These are two potential responses that you could have made with experience with professional archivists. One moment, please. There we go. Okay, sorry about that. There we go, readers off. Uh, with experience, professional archivists should be able to A, diagnose many of the causes of an item's decay. Some of you said that uh, should recognize decay, uh, which I gave you a half point for. Uh, and One moment, sorry. So
Sorry about that, folks. Uh, second was prescribe measures which will prevent or arrest uh, some decay of deterioration. Now, I was looking for minimal intervention. If you didn't write it, that's okay. Um, again, the answer did not have to be exact. Uh, I did give points for those that were close to this. Uh, number four, identify three potential causes of harm. Now, this is what I had originally uh, noted down in my key. However, some of you also included fire, which, yes, is a definite cause for harm to paper-based materials. So I, I did give you credit for that. Uh, five, identify characteristics of mass, uh, of ideal mass desidification solution. Now, that, oh, that was the key there, and I think um, some of you didn't realize I was looking for um, characteristics of the solution. Uh, so essentially, uh, require no pre-selection or sorting. So mass desidification so that everything can just be put in without any pre-sorting. Uh, an effective means of uh, evenly neutralizing the acid or depositing in alkaline reserves. Many of you included that bonus. Uh, it would be inexpensive. Uh, that was one of the issues with desidification was that the, the equipment and the process uh, was expensive. So an ideal is that it would be inexpensive. And finally, uh, non-toxic. So many of you said non-toxic. I gave you points for that. Um, or would pose no danger or risk to the material, the media, or people. That. Uh, answer to number six was um, uh, intellectually, an artist must be able to break down. Uh, if you said uh, if you said anything like uh, break down, deconstruct, take apart, that that all of that was fine. I gave you credit for that. Um, seven. Well, apparently the pictures did not show up, but um, seven. The answer was unethical. Uh, this is interesting that this came up in the reading this week. We didn't get a chance to talk about it uh, during the lecture, but. Um, it's interesting that ethical issues uh, seem to arise in almost every week, and that's uh, something that's continued on. All right, so the cause of damage from the first photo, which isn't here, unfortunately. Many of you said uh, fire damage, um, but if you said water or mold damage, you got the point. The second picture, it was foxing, and the third one was embrittlement. Uh, if you also said tearing, I gave you the point because it was tearing, but the uh, tearing was in uh, was likely caused by the embrittlement of paper. Uh, so, does anyone have any questions uh, about last week's uh, the quiz that I returned last week? Please type it into the chat box. In some forms of uh, this kind of technology, uh, participants actually have an opportunity to raise their hand as well. Um, unfortunately, I don't think you have an opportunity to do that here, which is which is a little unfortunate because that would be great. It, it's a great tool to notify the presenter or instructor that there are questions out there. All right, so I'm going to unmute. There might be some feedback. If there's feedback right away, I'm going to mute everybody right, right away again so we don't bust our eardrums. <laughs> We're just going to use chat for now. Um, yeah, all right. So any questions? Okay, I'm not seeing any questions. All right, so uh, all right, so we're going to move on to uh, risk analysis. And uh, below, one of the articles that I put through uh, the content folder for week six, she says that one of the strategic risks affecting reputation is being defined as is defined as being uh, a failure to guard the assets of the archive, uh, leading to uh, she says unacceptable loss. But I would say I would suggest any loss uh, of documents, information, or staff. Now, when we're talking about collection care, we really do mean all three. 
yeah, lots of documents, information, and stuff. Now, this week's lecture and next week's lecture, which we're talking, going to be talking about survey assessment, um, the two are really quite closely intertwined. Um, we're going to talk about needs analysis this week and to some degree prioritization. Next week, we will revisit the discussion of prioritization again. Um, but this week, you'll see reference right here, a collection condition survey is required uh, to really complete a thorough risk analysis. Um, it could be required for a subset of the collection, or it could be for the entire collection um, as well. Now, it could be, again, there are two general approaches to this kind of survey, item by item survey. Uh, could be conducted by a conservator or could be conducted by a team on which a conservator is a member. Um, often an archivist, the archivist who has the most detailed knowledge of the collection uh, is the, the lead for this kind of assessment. The statistical survey looks at a sampling of the, of the entire collection. So it gets the, the point of view of uh, as much of the global condition of the collection as possible. Now, the expected outcomes, the hoped outcomes, is to identify the hazards to the collection. These can be the po uh, potential hazards and actual hazards that are currently occurring and unabated or un, un, uh, are not previously recognized. Uh, prioritization uh, is also one of the outcomes. Uh, identifying those preservation uh, concerns uh, in a priority listing. Identifying the pres uh, preservation actions that are necessary to keep the collection in, uh, again, the best condition possible uh, for the long haul. Now, this can include uh, not necessarily preservation to specific items, but also um, improving the environment, improving the facility, improving storage, um, uh, securing securing uh, preservation measures to be taken in the future. So it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, something's going to happen immediately uh, and that it's going to be very expensive. Uh, the, the fix, the preservation action that is identified may in fact be something that is fairly cost effective. I know we've talked a lot about this and this is gonna come up again later in the lecture today. Um, and finally, uh, again, prioritizing the needs of the collection and identifying the steps that are required to achieve the preservation action. And we haven't talked about a pol uh, preservation policy yet. It's something we're actually going to touch on uh, towards the end of the term. But uh, these, uh, the target, the preservation action, are generally identified in the preservation policy itself. Now, the risk analyst, uh, analysis report summarizes the findings from the uh, collection assessment, identifies the time frame for short-term and long-term preservation priorities. So that is uh, issues of urgency um, within the collection. So again, it might not have to do with any specific items within or set of items within the collection, uh, a high priority um, item on this list that has a short-term time frame might be uh, a leak, a water leak, that has a great impact on the collection, for example. Um, but this, this report should also answer a few questions. There's three here, but there are a number of other questions that might be asked by uh, specific organizations, or by unique needs of organizations. Uh, the first question is, uh, what will have the greatest impact on the largest number of objects? My example was, um, uh, a leak, a water leak, um, could be the item that has the largest impact, for example. Two, uh, what is really possible in the institution? Is it, uh, is it feasible to install uh, an HVAC? If not, the, what is feasible, what is possible for the institution in, to respond to an item in the, in the report? And three, what action will have the greatest visibility or the greatest effect on future funding or public interest. And this is something that can play a specifically important role in terms of obtaining funding 
uh, for your organization. Now, the risk analysis report enables the organization to create the preservation plan um, that identifies specific items that need to be uh, taken care of or accounted for um, and the schedule to accomplish those particular projects. Now, there could be numerous preservation plans through the lifespan of an, orga of an or archival organization. And, however, there tends to be just one preservation plan going at a time. And I think in a strategic sense, this makes logical sense. So it's reasonable. Now, recommendations uh, tend to identify the risk elements to the collection. So this could be, again, it could be environment, it could be a lack of security, um, uh, in, ex expanded access, that sort of thing. Um, the recommendations should prioritize the levels of threat and identify steps for immediate action. Now this could be collection specific, so that if that organization has, say, a, uh, a storage area specific for, for example, photos and for film, um, it might be specific to that particular subset of the collection, or it could be for the collection overall. So for example, security might be something that is of concern to the overall collection. Now the recommendations could also include a financial assessment that uh, the financial needs required to comply with the recommended action. And in some cases, the recommended action might actually um, provide uh, choices with different financial valuations, right? So that the individuals who have to make the final decisions as to how they will proceed or what the preservation plan will look like um, are more informed about the options available to them so that they can attempt to meet the needs of the collection. Now, in terms of collection specific, here are some of the criteria in the box on the left that is often used in addressing priorities. So use, the, uh, this is again uh, usage rates. Now often what we'll see is uh, notes in documentation for specific collections or uh, fault within collections um, as to how often it's been taken out, uh, how long period, over how long a period of time. So this frequency of handling or frequency of usage uh, information is very useful. Uh, storage, whether or not the items have been moved, tra uh, transported from one facility to another facility. Uh, condition, again, this has to do with monitoring and should be documented uh, for each uh, item at risk. The value, of course, and finally, format. Overall, we are interested in these three things, not just these three things, but these three things that I'd like to look at. So overall, the um, impact that uh, criteria may have on the entire collection. Again, my example is environmental control. The feasibility of addressing those issues and urgency, right? So clearly, uh, if McGill Archives was completely flooded, for example, a couple of weeks ago, that would, that would pose some kind of urgency, right? Uh, to mitigate flood damage in the future, for example. Now, additional, additional criteria could also include the cost of the activity in terms of time. Now, installing an HVAC can actually take a great deal of time if renovation to the facility is required. And the renovation itself may actually pose a risk to the collection, which should, again, be taken into consideration. Uh, Staff requirements are additional resource requirements. So if one of the recommendations is to digitize um, a subset of the collection in order to uh, head off any increase in the fragility or the vulnerability of that subset, um, then those resources might include software, computers, scanning hardware, um, and so on, right? Uh, might also include additional requirements for staff, going beyond the staff that's already in-house. Time frame for the activity. Um, again, uh, HVAC, uh, the undertaking to install an HVAC is not, in Canada particularly, 
is not recommended for winter months, as I, I hope you can all understand. Um, having a renovation to uh, a building uh, during this season may pose an undue risk to your collection. However, uh, if there is a, a way to mitigate the environmental conditions, for example, over a shorter period of time that poses minimal risk to the collection, then that is likely to be uh, considered in your recommendation one of, as one of the options. And finally, the significance of the activity to the preservation program. So is it, if it is a new undertaking, this should be noted in the recommendation. Um, if it is a, um, an undertaking or recommendation that has been made in the past, this should also be noted as well. So this is a, an example of a risk assessment grid. And it essentially provides, uh, like, it's, like I said here, a quantifiable way of measuring risk. It also provides a, a nice visual representation of, of the risk assessment. Um, and we're going to actually start looking at more of this next week when we start looking at a uh, collection assessment survey. So as you can see here, the criteria at the top, impact, feasibility, I'm pointing at my screen, <laughs> impact, feasibility, urgency, and finally, risk rating. So that gives you an opportunity, and I've given you some categories, but it's not the finite list there. So internal building condition, for example, storage, and environment. So if for storage, uh, the storage material is predominantly made out of wood, which is not considered the ideal storage for our archival collections, if, if that is the highest concern, that you would give that the highest risk rating. And, but it should add up in terms of numbers. Now, the scale that's used is either a one, two, three, or a one to five. I haven't seen anything other than one to three or one to five, but you can pretty much use whatever assessment uh, range, var uh, variable range, uh, that is friendly to your organization. So we do see some variety in how this assessment is evaluated uh, for the different criteria. Is that clear? Okay, if you're all in the same lab and you all think it's clear, can someone please type yes? Excellent, thank you, Alan. You said yes. Send me another piece. <laughs> Excellent. And Catherine, thank you. All right, great. All right, so uh, here are some examples of the kinds of recommendations you'll see in, in a uh, risk analysis report. Uh, you'll see something along the lines of developing a formal uh, written billing maintenance schedule. So this is to do with housekeeping, for example. Uh, keeping a log of building problems and actions taken to solve them. So documenting more facilities management and housekeeping. Uh, fire detection system for the building inspected by a professional, testing the fire detectors on a quarterly basis, uh, holding a fire drill for staff. That would be great. Um, if collection is stored in a basement storage area, which frequently happens for archival organizations, um, ensuring that they are, I will, uh, Kath, uh, sorry, Kathleen, yeah, I will be posting the video of the lecture afterwards. Sorry you're having a hard time hearing. Uh, I've got my volume up as much as I can. So yes, I will be posting it. Um, the slides will be posted separately, but they will also be in the video as well. Hopefully it'll look just like what you're seeing right now, but you'll have an opportunity to increase the volume. Uh, okay, uh, and then you updating the, live, the master disaster plan is another example of what you might see. All right, so I'm going to move on to planning and budgeting for preservation. Now, the ARL, the Association for Research Libraries, um, has an annual report on preservation statistics. They have stopped after 2007, but if you click on that link, once I've published the slide, uh, that will take you right to the PDF of the most recent publication for preservation statistics. And it includes um, the structure of the preservation program, staffing, expenditures, conservation treatment, and reformatting. So much of this information is actually 
quite important to uh, moving forward and providing support to the decisions that we make in our kind of organization for our preservation planning. Now, the research libraries with active preservation programs uh, can spend between 5 to 10 percent. Um, my other uh, additional research in this area has, has supported this, um, this suggestion as well. Uh, but this doesn't include the costs associated with maintaining a building, maintaining the HVAC system, for example, uh, for buying new shelving or storage uh, for the collection itself um, or the overall environment. Now, the same tends to be true of libraries as it is for archives. The larger the organization, the higher the percentage of the total uh, budget that can be directed to preservation. So we tend to find that this is relatively true, but where in preservation that money is allocated tends to vary. So more frequently, you know, in the last couple of years, we've seen greater funding going toward digitization as a means of preserving the collection um, than to uh, hard preservation or conservation treatment. Now, this is general, these, this information is collected by ARL. So they didn't include archives in their analysis or in their data collection. Um, but it is a, a, a good general model to use in terms of other information institutions or cultural institutions as well. Um, so museum organizations will often use this kind of data to uh, support their preservation planning too. Now, one form of uh, funding or financing preservation program uh, is reallocation. So rather than finding more funding, uh, re-examining the funding that is already allocated for the archival organization. So um, reviewing the budget, identifying activities that since designing the budget or putting the budget, finalizing the budget have become less of a of a priority and increasing the priority for something within the preservation plan. That's a, an example of the allocation. Now, many of the items or activities that are included in preservation planning will already be included in the budget. So uh, pur purchasing our uh, acid-free material or archive uh, quality material like boxes and folders, um, bind binders, for example, uh, they'll already be included in the budget. So reallocation tends not to be necessary for these particular activities. Uh, however, in archival organizations where, uh, it's where the, the operation is integrated in a larger organization, say a government organization, or uh, the other example is McGill University Archive, where it's integrated uh, into the larger university, um, then collaboration across departmental lines is often required. I know in the past we've talked about creating committees in order to um, strategically move programs forward, and this is another way uh, which a collaborative community would also be required. All right, now cost analysis. Um, I don't know if many of you have had to do cost analysis in the past, um, but this is, to a minor uh, degree, associated with your prioritization and your risk analysis assessment that I spoke of earlier in the lecture today. The cost analysis could be needed for numerous uh, situations. So if you're submitting a budget proposal for a preservation activity, uh, a cost analysis would be required uh, so that the organization has a basis to make their decision. Uh, preparing a response to a request for cost reduction, developing a cost estimate for a grant proposal seeking external funding, and comparative cost uh, analysis to conduct an activity in-house uh, rather than outsourcing the activity. Now, I know Amy talked about this to some degree last week uh, in discussing the value of owning their own digitization equipment rather than outsourcing the digitization process. So these are um, these are just four areas that require the cost analysis to be conducted. And again, um, 
options are often um, used in order to sort of explore uh, the variety or the range of financial investment required for different components. Now, in the last um, two years, again, yep, year and a half, more like, a Library of North Canada has had to prepare responses to uh, cost reduction mandates. Um, this is another area where the cost reduction mandate says, suggested or stated that service was going to be reduced. Since that time, uh, a response had been presented uh, where a cost reduction was made in a different area and uh, service levels were not reduced as greatly as they were originally planned. So we do see a, a real concrete way in which this kind of reporting does benefit the organization and the client groups as well. Now, when the uh, product, services, or whatever the activity is identified, um, Detailed information on the procedures to carry out that activity, to purchase the service or purchase the equipment, uh, needs to be included in the cost assessment. Uh, often what we'll see is uh, invisible costs that uh, are difficult to include in a, in a very surface cost analysis. So we'll have to include things like um, shipping, for example, if you're purchasing uh, equipment. So shipping, taxes, and maintenance as well. Uh, which needs to be included in the long-term cost analysis of purchasing equipment, for example. Now, the cost for preservation uh, is usually uh, uh, analyzed against the need, the impact, risk, and available resources. Uh, now, this en enables the person who's creating the cost analysis um, uh, a range of, you know, ideal, this would be the ideal solution while recognizing that financially it may not be realistic for the organization. Two, something that is more realistic financially for an organization um, in terms of, again, impact risk, available resources, and, and of course, need. Now, We've talked about in this class before, and I'm, I'm sure in other classes, you've probably had discussions about the ideal situation. The ideal would be to have a, a top of the line HVAC, but financially, it's often not a feasible option. It's just too expensive, right? Now, the budgeting overall tends to integrate spending again on materials and activities that tend to be closely aligned with the preservation management, like purchasing the acid free materials, um, packaging materials, and so forth. However, additional costs, like the procurement of services from a conservator, are often not included in overall budgeting. However, preservation should be considered a core archival function. So it's not, it's not unrelated to overall management of an archive. Now, we've talked about reallocating funds, creating a cost analysis, but part of the cost analysis could also be a, uh, a plan to um, fundraise or to gain the additional uh, revenues required for the ideal solution. So if the, the ideal solution is too expensive and there is no other reasonable solution, then fundraising will be required. Uh, will at least very least be necessary to secure the additional revenue, right? So, I hope no one's falling asleep. <laughs> um, in the United States, there are several grant programs uh, that are available for by application uh, for funding collection care, preservation, and conservation. Uh, some of those funding, funding options are available for all three, so there's a global, uh, pro global project for archival or heritage organizations, which could include museums uh, and libraries as well, um, but also could be for individual programs, so collection care generally, preservation, conservation. Now, collection care is a long-term plan, it's a long-range plan, and it can serve as a spark to uh, create um, fundraising activities. Now, the key component, 
key component here, and if you hear me jump, it's because, <laughs> because uh, there was a noise coming out of the system. The key components here uh, are educating the funders and the general public, your client group, resource development, and uh, the, a handy, handy uh, percentage breakdown is it's 20% solicitation, 80% cultivation. So that, so let's go back to, so the 20% solicitation is where you're actively asking for funding. The 80% cultivation is, is your outreach activity. It's your marketing and communications plan, right? So it's creating the situation so that your solicitation efforts are more successful. Now in active fundraising, so this is a solicitation, um, collection care has actually been fairly successful in acting as a catalyst for fundraising, uh, fundraising, um, because it can be targeted, uh, to specific project grants or to specific, uh, client groups within a local, uh, community. Now here are some, uh, some areas, some ways in which, uh, active fundraising can be approached. So fundraisers can solicit the prospective donors, um, but you, they need to determine who the donors are and uh, how much they would reasonable, reasonably be expected to donate to collection care. Um, if any of you are familiar with the put, put in the door approach, uh, this is the idea that you, you ask for a huge sum of money, but then with the expectation that you'll never say I will never give that much amount uh, that amount of money. But then you step right back to what your real expectation is. So if you ask for five hundred dollars, most owners uh you know uh, in your average client group will say uh no that's a lot of money. But then if you back right off and say twenty five dollars then the twenty five dollars same thing comparatively it's a much more reasonable request for donation. Um, cultivation, again, it develops the interest of the donor group and exposes them to program activities, people, needs, and plans. And this is the key to the outreach program um, in educating the client group about the activities within the organization, the organization itself, but also educating the management about the interests of the prospective donors so that what you show them is something that invest their interest and will hopefully support their investment financially in the organization as well. So cultivation is is a, is a deep involvement between both the client group and the uh, staff of the archival organization. Now this requires a, a real partnership relationship between the two in order to ensure that outreach becomes successful and uh, the environment or the culture for uh, fundraising, for attracting funding to collection care becomes that much more uh, probable. I'm not gonna say it's guaranteed, but it becomes that much more probable. Now, uh, uh, who, who said this? One of the sources for this week's reading said that donors want to give money. Um, but the key is uh, to match their wants and interests with your opportunity. Now, I don't necessarily agree with this statement. I don't think that people just are dying to give away their money. Um, I know I, I'm not. <laughs> but I think that what is important here is the matching of the want and interest um, with what your collection has to offer. So. Sources of money, this brings us to sources of money. So we have individual uh, private philanthropy. So many of you may be aware that um, um, the often very wealthy individuals in society will uh, donate huge sums of money. So the Gates Foundation, for example, donates billions of dollars to education every year. And Bill, Great, Bill Gates is a, Bill and Melinda Gates, they're very wealthy folks. Unfortunately, we don't have a Bill and Melinda Gates in every community. Uh, they tend to be fairly rare. 
the more common uh, philanthropists, common individuals will be your average visitor to your collection or the average individual within your community um, who doesn't know yet about your collection. Another source that would include foundations, so private foundations, corporate foundations, community and family foundations. So often linking the interest between foundations, and again, corporations is another interest group um, that you can identify here, but making the explicit connection between the mandates for those organizations and the mandates or the collection, um, collection items or collection orientation uh, for your organization can play a key role in making that relationship uh, between your organization and potential uh, funders. And finally, uh, government, uh, government sources, so uh, state or provincial uh, or local sources. So this has to do with uh, grant opportunities, um, uh, cultural grants, fellowship opportunities, uh, support for, in terms of uh, summer students, uh, subsidized employment, and, and so forth. Now, these kinds of funding opportunities tend to vary. Um, we do see some things that are fairly common, so subsidized employment see that as fairly common. Um, however, funding for fellowships or uh, grants can be very competitive. So this is one of those areas where uh, this particular source is fairly challenging to secure, for, particularly for smaller uh, archival organizations. The guiding principles here are to uh, have active fundraising and a public relations um, identity. Uh, often we'll see uh, public relations uh, organizations having uh, a Facebook identity, for example, a Facebook profile or a LinkedIn account, for example, uh, in trying to communicate with uh, clients that aren't just necessarily local, but could be worldwide. Uh, Long-range planning and fundraising. This is particularly, key. this is again, very important. Um, strong programming. So if you are talking about collection care with your potential donors, there is a tangible uh, uh, program plan for collection care in place. Uh, capitalizing on the visual, I'm gonna show you an example of that in a moment. But uh, archival collections tend to be pretty diverse, and we've already seen this term, and I'm sure you've seen it in courses with, uh, with uh, Gordy. Um, the wonderful diversity we have in the visual impact that some of our archives, uh, our items can have in an archival collection. Uh, acknowledging donors, number five, and number six, collaborating. So not necessarily worrying about fundraising, uh, as an individual organization, but collaborating in fundraising campaigns with other um, cultural organizations, so museums and libraries again, but also with educational institutions like New Deal University, for example. All right, so here are, are a few strategies. I'm not going to go through all of them, but these are some of the strategies on conducting a fundraising campaign. Okay, so uh, in acquisition. Uh, in terms of procuring items for a collection through acquisition, often uh, what can be done is determining whether or not there is an ongoing expense for maintaining those new items and negotiating for some financial support to support that maintenance, that, that ongoing care for those particular items. Uh, adoption campaigns, you may be familiar with this, where uh, client groups or individuals can adopt um, items or sub-collections within an archival institution. Um, budgeting, again, this is through reallocation for, in a lot of cases, uh, endowments, special events. I'm uh, not sure if I can think of a special event that's been connected with an archival organization recently, um, but often what we'll see is uh, there, the archives of the University of Guelph, that is not recent, but in um, 2004, um, had a black tie dinner for Robbie Burns' birthday. Um, about 50% of the, the 
uh, revenue went towards rare books and special collections. Um, they needed to have custom made encapsulation boxes for parchment. Uh, I think they were treaties. But they were able to secure the funds. I mean, it was a very well, event, well attended event. event. Um, it was hosted in Toronto by the Scottish Society of Canada. Um, and it, it was it was quite well done. But I haven't seen that, I haven't seen much in that way either. I think, and perhaps it's because special events have uh, a requirement for an initial investment. So uh, the organizations themselves themselves need to have that uh, money, that revenue, to invest in the planning for the event in the anticipation for the uh, fundraising revenue. Uh, there's also planned giving, uh, funding in perpetuity, for example, and again, again, federal grants. Now, in terms of finding donors, uh, locating donors, uh, it sounds like it can be a fairly tricky um, venture. However, uh, identifying the uh, special interest group or collectors who have shared interests or similar interests to uh, what your collection represents. Uh, friends group, so I mentioned the Scottish Society of Toronto, so that sort of organization. Skill, now there is a um, Book Finders Guild of Montreal, it's actually Book Finders Guild of Canada, but there is a chapter within Montreal. Societies, again, persons with vested interest. Excuse me, staff. And for online exhibits, web surfers. So people who aren't even in the local area, but may have an interest in what your collection has, so what you have in your collection, and what you do for cultural memory interest. So here's an example of um, something that was uh, a fundraising campaign from the Virginia Historical Society. Um, the poster is an appeal uh, for a funding campaign, but it's interesting that it, now, you are gonna be looking in the quiz at photography. This picture is not one of them, you'll be happy to know. But uh, hopefully you'll recognize this as a, uh, a photo that's representative of a print type that would be of interest um, to document for an item in an archival collection. Um, but this is an example of, you know, the visualization, the impact of the visualization from a collection. Uh, they've been very clever, saved the photograph. Um, this isn't part of a, an a adoption campaign, but could easily be part of an adoption campaign. Um, and uh, it, it, I think it's fairly amusing uh, campaign approach. Okay, are there any questions about uh, financial management and fundraising? We're going to talk a little bit more about financial management in the last week of the, le of the lecture series uh, when we've got um, a representative from the uh, Gay Archives of Quebec to come talk about managing a small community-based archive as well. Um, you will also have an opportunity in this week's discussion in the forum to talk about financial management. Um, hopefully, what I've shown you is that um, the answer is that simply there is no money. Um, that's almost a, a given, unfortunately. Um, but the answer is, if you have no money, there should be a way to plan to attain it or to generate revenue in some way. Right? Um, the key, though, is that it needs to be done actively. And again, it's the most effort is done in cultivating the, um, the opportunity, the, the, the culture of giving within the organization. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about storage and housing. So the first thing I want to talk about is encapsulation. We've talked about encapsulation um, several times at this point, and uh, the Canada uh, Canadian Conservation Institute has uh, a note, uh, 11 slash 10, 
uh, called encapsulation, which gives the description, specific detailed description about encapsulation in polyester cells. So that's something that you can actually go to CCI and download it. It's a, a free download um, if you want to have the specific details about it. Now, encapsulation, generally speaking, is where clear plastic sleeve is used to enclose damaged or heavily used um, documents or items. Now, it allows for um, um, safer handling of the item and can support oversized records as well that, again, may be vulnerable if handled improperly. The materials can include uh, plastic, uh, plastic film of polyurethane, uh, carob phthalate, or polyester, um, which is often used to sandwich an item between two pieces. Uh, it goes by a trade name, DuPont Mylar Type B and Mylanex Type 516. And I know I've included this detail in previous slides, so um, it, it is something that's commonly used in archive management. Um, also in rare books, if you are hoping to work in a, a special collection. Uh, double sided 3M uh, 415 tape uh, can be used to hold the two sheets of polyester together. Now this helps to avoid um, having to use heat pressure to seal the two sheets together, which again can pose a risk to the to the items being encapsulated. Now, not every item, uh, flat item, I should say, uh, can be encapsulated or should be encapsulated because the polyester material uh, can build a, an electrostatic charge, uh, loose, embrittled paper that is flaking, or photographs where the emulsion is cracked and flaking um, may be made worse uh, or put into a, vul a more vulnerable state if encapsulated uh, in this way. Now, other items would include uh, charcoal, which the material can actually lift off the page of so charcoal, chalk, pastel, anything that is flaking or unstable, that material. Parchment and vellum are not generally uh, encapsulated because the inks and colors are not integrated into the uh, support surface, the parchment or vellum itself. And finally, damp or moldy material because encapsulation can exacerbate or create a worsening of the effects of the damp, dampness and uh, accelerate mold growth, which of course is vulnerable. So here are some of the uh, common handling procedures you'll see in archives organization. Uh, many of these you'll be familiar with. Uh, some of you have even mentioned them in class, so wearing gloves, for example, um, limiting handling of materials, uh, Ensuring that everything, all of your items are appropriately stored in archive quality uh, containers, whether they are folders or boxes, custom fit boxes. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'm not going to go through this entire list, um, but this last item I want to draw your attention to isolate new acquisitions on arrival until they've been found for signs of test activity and mold. Now, I don't know if many of you are familiar with this, but there was a public library recently that discovered that uh, a set of new acquisitions uh, actually contained bed bugs and caused the spread of bed bugs within the community because they weren't examined when they were first uh, accepted for acquisition. This is an example where <laughs> there's a, been a disastrous um, effect on the community, but, uh, and again, it would be horrible for an archival organization. But additionally, if the collection that has recently been acquired is infected with mold that is not caught can spread to other items within the collection. Um, additionally, um, other insects uh, and uh, can pose devastating risk to your collection. And again, require great cost to repair. Now, this listing 
is for internal staff handling. So those folks who have to go back into the collection, retrieve the items, and are returning the items back to where they're stored. This set is intended for publication. So this should be um, posted in a publicly visible location. Alternatively, uh, or in addition, perhaps, um, borrowers may be required to actually sign an agreement that they will abide by these rules. So a limit to the number of items provided to a researcher at one time. Um, it's just one of the examples. Uh, provide adequate space so the researcher can handle the record safely. Reshell the items promptly, avoid circulating fragile items, and so on. Handling rules, so again, draw the list of rules up for the researchers and make them a condition of use of the collection of the archive. Now the staff should understand the requirements made of the researchers and should understand the preservation principles that require those rules to be in place so that they can ensure or monitor um, uh, client behavior or client treatment of items well in the organization. Again, the rules should be posted in a very visible place and a compliance may become a rule, uh, a, a, two rules may be a condition of even gaining access to the collection. In larger organizations like the British National Archives, this last um, element is something that we often see. So in order to gain access to any, even just one item, um, there's a long list of rules and patrons have to sign at the bottom of it. So here are some example rules. Again, many of you have uh, are familiar with these rules, right? So no eating, drinking, or smoking. Obviously no smoking. That's kind of an older rule. Um, using only a pencil. Uh, last week we saw in our book that coats bags were left in a shelving unit to the side, so clients didn't even have access to that material. Um, treating archival collections carefully, for example, using gloves while handling the, treat, the uh, material. Um, not re removing material from encapsulation if encapsulation has been used, like mylar sleeves, for example, or from envelopes. And again, um, identifying whether or not items can actually be uh, touched or accessed by clients coming in. Uh, so reformatting through different means may be the only possible way that they have access to the So some alternatives here, these are the uh, surrogates, the alternative methods for uh, patrons to access uh, originals through photocopying, which is often one of the most cost-effective. Unfortunately, photocopying is not a really good long-term uh, plan for creating surrogates, but photocopy, uh, photograph of original um, items, microforms, so microfiche, microfilm, and finally, digital copies. So more and more archives are, uh, have, uh, have computer terminals, which have direct access to an internal server, which, uh, again, may have the digital copies or digital surrogates of items within the collection. However, what we often see in terms of digital surrogates is we'll often see that uh, samples within a collection uh, have been digitized, whether the entire collection or entire font within a collection. Now, I've mentioned housekeeping and uh, We've talked a little bit about housekeeping before, sort of on a tangent, but regular housekeeping is actually quite important in terms of ensuring that the environment is safe and clear of debris or um, dust that can cause abrasion or um, damage your collection. So an inspection routine is important, ensuring that the area, the storage area, as well as the reading room areas, the uh, access areas, are um, uh, assessed in terms of um, areas where uh, items may be uh, may become vulnerable uh, due to uh, poor surfaces for for storage. Say, for example, in, in the reading room, uh, leaks, water leaks, uh, presence of pets, pests, and again, fire hazards. Um, organizing a regular cleaning program, 
uh, primarily adjusting um, and ensuring that there is a uh, there is a plan in place to reduce the buildup of pollutants in the air as well. And finally, restricting uh, again eating, drinking, and smoking. Alexander, do you have a question? I keep getting an arrow. Error, uh, an arrow. Do you have a question? <laughs> I can hear Alexandra now. Do you have a question? No. Okay, okay. <laughs> All, right. All right, so storage furniture. So um, in terms of what you folks have, have worked with in the past, um, what kind of storage furniture have you seen? I want you to write in the chat box. What have you seen in your experiences in archives or cultural and heritage communities, uh, organizations? Huge metal shot, yeah, stacks of boxes. Now, Talia, was there a, uh, a maximum for the number of boxes that could be stacked? Okay, so it was limited by the shelving size. Um, in one organization where I work, they, okay, someone has said, all right, so Amelia said that it was too deep and too high for shelf. Um, in some locations for uh, museal archives, that's the way I've seen it. I've also seen it three high and too deep. Um, in an organization I previously worked in, it was actually five boxes were able to be stacked. On each other, and often what we saw was that the last, the bottom box or the bottom two boxes even, um, literally cave in on themselves because of the weight of the other boxes. So often we'll see a requirement for um, uh, more support furniture, which limits the number of boxes, reduces the, the maximum number of boxes that can be piled on top of each other. Now the the preferred uh, material for storage furniture is powder coated steel. Um, because the powder coating uh, sort of stops any uh, uh, contamination or off-gassing from the store, uh, supply material, the shelving material, um, on the collection that's being stored on their shelf. Baked enamel steel is also an alternative, or what we've commonly seen. However, the enamel itself, it, there's concern about off-gassing from the enamel, specifically formaldehyde. Um, there has been some uh, some research done in this area that looked at the effect of off-gassing off formaldehyde on boxes. And what they have found is that the boxes actually begin to crumble where they sit on the shelf. So they actually effectively leach. It leaches the moisture out of the boxes and can effectively damage the material inside. Now, wood is actually at the lowest um, preference. Um, because there are, of course, acidic emissions. It is that's what we make our paper out of. Lignin is what comes out of the tree, into out of the pulp, into paper, which we try to take out. But when we make it in shelves, uh, we don't take the we don't take the lignin out. So uh, they have a they have a quality of lignin and a component of lignin and uh, can off gas in acidic emissions. Now, sealants have been used in order to hinder this off-gassing. Um, however, uh, the sealants themselves, themselves have a potential to off-gas byproducts. Um, if you do need to use wooden, wooden support shelves, um, which is often the cheapest uh, alternative for support furniture, then the recommendation is to use medium to high density overlaid plywood. Um, it has uh, the longest um, lifespan with the least amount of uh, acidic emission. Um, so, unfortunately, um, pine is not, so IKEA does not sell the, the best shelf for an archive. For example, storage materials, housing, Handling. 
I'm going to try to unmute. <laughs> All right. Okay. Are there any questions about this particular topic? Please use the chat box. We're going to move on to exhibitions in a minute. Okay, I'm not seeing any uh, anything arriving in this chat box, but I want to give you a chance in case you do need a few minutes. Okay, good. Thank you, Talia. All right, so I'm going to move on to exhibitions. Excellent. Thank you, Emma. Um, now, in terms of exhibitions, in context to this course, I'm not going to talk about how to design and plan a, an exhibition. Um, generally speaking, I'm going to talk about it from a preservation perspective. Uh, now, some of you may be interested in exhibition planning, and uh, it's something that uh, I think needs needs to be done uh, within the program. Uh, has Gordy talked about exhibitions actually in his courses? Okay, all right. Um, I know that. Um, Anne Marie Holland, who we met last week in Rare Books, I know that she's been involved in several exhibitions. Um, and it's something that, uh, that I, when I was a student in the last program, I, I really wanted someone to talk more about. Um, unfortunately, in, in the context of this course, um, I'm only really going to talk about it in terms of uh, preservation matters, preservation management. All right, so in terms of uh, exhibition of archival material, uh, many organizations have an exhibit policy, which outlines specific requirements for exhibitions, uh, including environmental conditions, uh, so uh, the, the lighting requirements, the relative humidity requirements, um, uh, temperature requirements, uh, and also uh, the duration of uh, exposure through exhibitions for items. Uh, limitation of loaning original items for exhibition purposes to other organizations, uh, security requirements, exhibition case, the actual equipment that's used for the exhibition, so the, the case, matting, and framing requirements, um, authority for approving exhibitions, so the protocol, uh, condition and transit or transfer for items, and finally, documentation requirements for external uh, exhibitions. So this is uh, an example of what you might see for a uh, recommended exhibition light level. So in the, in the uh, policy, exhibition policy, you'll often see this kind of uh, table uh, that represents the requirements for not just the uh, reading room and uh, um, say the collection area or the, the storage area, but also for exhibition purposes. So you see here, for exhibition purposes, the light requirement, 55 to 165 lux, is a great deal lower than what we see for the requirements in the reading room. The reading room has 330 to 660 lux. And um, when we're talking about um, environmental concerns, one of the, the points, the challenges that we talked about uh, with the idea that we have um, a very broad demographic of clients that come in and utilize archives within reading rooms who often need to have significant lighting in order to be able to use, this, use our archival collection. For exhibition purposes, we've dramatically reduced the, uh, the lighting requirements. Now, you can see that in the uh, Ritz and Holler, uh, so there's actually two sources here, Lull and Ritz and Holler. Ritz and Holler has said 50 lux for sensitive material, but varies it so that they can go up to 100 to 150 for less sensitive material. So I kind of like, I prefer Ritz and Holler's approach because it's illustrating that different items within a collection have different tolerances. Now, if you remember, back to the conversation about environmental concerns, that's more of the approach what we see, of what we see now. 
So we start seeing more of the unique tolerances and requirements in terms of environmental controls within our collection. Okay. In terms of exhibit design, um, we often have we have uh, several considerations. This is not a complete listing, but this is very generally uh, some of the considerations that are involved in designing an exhibit. So the environmental again tolerances and limitations of the items to be exhibited, the duration of the exhibition, the insurance requirements. Uh, security requirements, and uh, if they are for external exhibits, lending and borrowing, and finally, documenting the condition of the item to be uh, included in the exhibition. Now, the documentation is for uh, prior to the exhibition and for following the exhibition in order to monitor any changes in the condition for the items that are involved in the exhibition. In terms of mounting the exhibition, the exhibit cases um, should regulate and monitor the environment in which the pieces are in. Now, if you look at the two examples that I have here, the, the longer one, really hard to describe. Okay, so the one on the left and the one on the right are both enclosed. So clients coming to view the exhibit um, cannot access the item. Uh, and the items are also, because they're enclosed, are a little more protect, protected from the environment of the room. So there is an opportunity to impose um, the ideal, or create the ideal relative humidity um, and uh, temperature within those environments. Now, if you look at the picture on the right, you'll notice that the room is actually quite a bit dim. Uh, and that there is lighting on the specific cases themselves. You see the one at the very far back wall and the ones that are flat, the flat tables. Um, you see that there's specific lighting at, on those areas. Now, this is a, a good example of uh, limiting uh, the luck uh, dimensions for specific items within a collection that are on exhibit. Now, in addition to this, uh, you know, ensuring that the cases regulate and monitor the environment. Um, ensuring that the material selection within the individual cases um, is done in a uh, strategic way so that we can ensure that um, material stored in the same cabinet won't have a detrimental effect on each other for the duration of the exhibition. So some items, uh, such as uh, some realia uh, components, which may off-gas or cause corrosion, to other materials are not stored in the same cabinet. If they are, then a barrier, some kind of barrier may be used. Now, in some cases, what we'll see is um, realia is stored on its own. We'll see paper in one area, and we'll see a separation of uh, sub parts of the exhibition. Now, I had hoped to have a, um, a case study small group case study uh, in class uh, assignment. Uh, however, we're not going to be able to do that today. Um, I hope, I'm not sure if we're going to be able to do it next week either. Next week, we're going to have our final quiz on environmental concerns. We have Sylvia Kendall, who is the uh, archival conservator for City of Ottawa. She is a book and paper conservator. That's her specialization. So if you have any questions for book and paper conservation, Please bring them next week for sure. Um, she's really looking forward to coming and talking with us. She's coming off of a, I think she's coming off of sabbatical. Um, the lecture next week, we're going to address collection assessment, uh, specifically looking at preservation surveys and prioritizing preservation efforts. So we're going to deep dive a little bit more in designing matrices for prioritizing preservation needs. Um, uh, if we have time next week, we are going to uh, do an in-class assignment, but probably more in terms of the survey and prioritization efforts, uh, prioritization planning. Now, in the course outline, originally at the beginning of the term, um, I had written that the fact sheet assignment was due next week. However, in the uh, assignment guideline, it has said the 25th, week eight. 
which is right before your reading week. Um, because of uh, some of the delays we've had and, and this week with me not being in Ottawa, the deadline will be in week eight. So if you're screwing to get it done this week, you have some more time, okay? So you don't need to scurry at nearly as much. Um, but uh, if you have any questions about the assignment, again, please feel free to uh, either post in the forum. There's a forum specifically for assignments. Um, or, again, email me. Um, I can also obviously be reached by video. <laughs> so the deadline for the fact sheet will be in week eight. I have updated the syllabus to reflect this. And I've posted it. It's been revised. I'm going to type this as well. Week eight. Okay. This means that next week we don't, there isn't going to be nearly as much hurrying or rushing to uh, um, have Syl Sylvia come and speak with us next week and to look at the, uh, the lecture content. Uh, in terms of uh, collection assessment and uh, surveys. All right. 